Welcome to World 101X, Anthropology of Current World Issues. Uh, we're here at the AAA conference in Minneapolis and we have the pleasure of being joined this evening by Kim Tolbert. Thanks so much for joining us. You're welcome. Um, I understand this is a special place for you to be because here we're on, the, on your land, the mm -hmm. land of your people. Yeah. Um, and so I'm just wondering if we might be able to start, if you could tell us a bit of your background or your connection to this place. Um, yeah, I'm Metawankantawan Dakota, so there are uh, multiple Dakota bands, but uh, my ancestors come from what is basically now downtown St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, my four greats grandfather, his village was there. Um, there was a war in 1862 between the, uh, the U.S. and Dakota people, and that's when my ancestors were exiled from Minnesota and so I grew up in South Dakota where the Dakota reservations are in the eastern part of the state but yeah this is Dakota homeland Anishinaabe people are also from here and uh, historically we warred a little bit and we also uh, intermarried so and, mm -hmm. and today we have a, I think a friendly rivalry and we do a lot of work together in the Twin Cities Dakota and Anishinaabe people building um, indigenous urban institutions. Mm. That's something I'd love to come back to over the course of the interview as we talk about your work okay. as an anthropologist. Um, but I think it would be great for people if you'd be able to just give us a little bit of an overview in terms of your history and how you came to study anthropology and, and later work as an anthropologist. Well, I'm a second career academic. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't start my PhD until I was 32, which is a bit late for uh, academics. But I trained first as a community and environmental planner. My mom never graduated from university, but she did community planning, and she's still an indigenous planner. And so the work that she did made sense to me. And she started doing uh, activist work as a young college student, but eventually turned into a planner as she began writing grants to build uh, urban Native American uh, alternative housing, uh, survival schools, uh, indigenous education. Uh, then she moved home to our reservation in South Dakota and helped start our tribal school, which is now K through 12 and is a big, beautiful building. She helped start a, a drug and alcohol rehab center on our reservation, which has a Dakota kind of ceremonial curriculum. And so I grew up watching her do all that kind of work. And I thought, well, being a planner is a good work and I also won't be poor and destitute doing it. You know, I thought I could get a middle-class job. And so I went and I did a master's and a bachelor's degree in that. Worked as a planner for about eight or nine years and realized that it wasn't really where my intellectual heart was. But I just, um, by chance, happened to be working on a project uh, for the Department of Energy. I was a contractor. I did a lot of work, liaison work, between federal agencies and tribal governments. Mm -hmm. And the Department of Energy in uh, the early to mid-1990s was trying to figure out how to clean up or manage the nuclear weapons complex, a tremendous amount of contamination on those sites. And, and there are tribes near to those sites that have sacred sites, uh, cultural sites within those, those uh, nuclear reservations. And so uh, we were, I was working with tribal environmental scientists and cultural people, and the, it just so happened that the Department of Energy at the time, this is in from the mid-90s to 2000, they started funding the mapping of the human genome. Mm -hmm. And the organization I work for started to also think about doing tribal liaison work around uh, human genetics. And I was, got fascinated with the language of race and purity and, and, and admixture around genetics and realized, but I don't have the background to intervene in this conversation. I'm an environmental planner. So I decided to go back and do a PhD somewhere where I could study the politics of genetics mm -hmm. uh, in relationship to race. And I didn't know where to go. And I just happened to be reading James, Clif James, James, Clifford, James Clifford's book one day, The Predicament of Culture. And I thought, well, I'll go where this guy is. And Donna Haraway's there too, and she works on science. And, they both together kind of merge my interests around the politics of culture, the politics of science. They're in the same department. I applied to history of consciousness and I got in, but I had no idea what it was and then did a PhD in the humanities. Mm. And, and as part of that, uh, started interviewing scientists. I mm -hmm. got really interested in, in uh, what their points of view were on genetics. And part of that was because the, the project that initially made sense for my dissertation was to look at what indigenous people think of genetics. But I realized when I was early on uh, doing my dissertation work, wait a minute, it doesn't matter what we think. We're in a sense not the problem. The problem here uh, in terms of the histories of race and how we're th those are playing out in contemporary genetics it's scientists and Euro-Americans Euro and their histories of, of racial ideas and categories. That's mm -hmm. the problem. 
So I'm not going to study us because also everybody's always studying Native Americans. Why should I go home and study us? I'm going to study them. So it was actually a way for me to do a performative act, turn the gaze back on mostly white guys who do genetics, uh, and say, no, I'm going to study you because aren't your views about race and genetics really curious? And why do you always want to study us? Why are you so interested in, in uh, telling this, this immigration or migration story over and over again through genetics? And so for me, it was both interesting, but it was also an act of decolonization and an act of turning the tables. Mm. Did you find that you needed to be creative in terms of methodological frameworks in order to carry that project out and I'm yes. thinking here I've noticed in a couple of articles you use the term studying across right I'm not sure if that comes from that work or it does lucky for me because uh, Donna Haraway was one of my advisors and she's a feminist science studies scholar I was exposed to a lot of feminism feminist scientists and that's how I came to feminism I did not consider myself a feminism feminist before I uh, got in touch with feminist science studies people but feminist uh, STS feminist science studies feminist anthropologists look at um, their feminism tells them to dismantle hierarchies in knowledge production. And so one of the scholars I ran across early in my work was Laura Nader, who wrote a very important piece all these years later. I think she published this piece in maybe 1967 called Up the Anthropologist. And, and at that time, and this is during the Vietnam War, she said, why are we always studying the poor natives, the, the impoverished? Let's study those in power. You know, this, this is who's giving us trouble. And she talked about studying uh, people in high levels of government and people in corporations. Well, at the same time that Laura Nader was saying that in the middle of the Vietnam War, Vine Deloria Jr., probably the most prominent Native American scholar of the 20th century, was also uh, writing articles parodying anthropology, saying, oh, he wrote an article called Anthropologists and Other Friends in 1969, where he said, oh, look at these anthropologists coming into our communities and studying us. And he talked about their quaint life ways. And it was a parody, but it was really a critique. And so I got what Laura Nader was saying, because Vine Deloria, as a very young child, my mom had that book in our house before I could read. I was influenced by his critique of the academy and the hierarchies and knowledge production and the making native people into these kind of laboratory mice, right? Mm -hmm. And so it, um, feminism helped give me a theoretical language for that all those years later. And, and I was lucky to be surrounded by feminist science studies people in the academy, Donna and many other mentors that I had. Sandra Harding is somebody else that I worked with. I read feminist uh, critical geography, uh, critical geographers, feminist geographers talk about caring for your subject researching, but also researching uh, people or communities that you might be critical of, but you might also be invested in working from within and helping change them. And that brought another ethical framework to my work with scientists as well. Mm. Not just study them, but do work in, to help them maybe change from within. Mm. That idea of care, actually, that's something that I see recurring throughout your work. And right. it's something that I wanted to, um, to ask if you could unpack a little further. What is care right. as... Um, perhaps an academic framework or as a methodology right. that could be useful to anthropologists. And I'm wondering even if we might be able to put care into conversation with some of your recent work as well on multi-species or mm -hmm. interspecies uh, ways of knowing. And again, okay. as a feminist indigenous scholar, the ways in which you're perhaps reworking methodologies around these sorts of notions. Okay, you might have to bring me back to multi-species, sure. uh, but I'll start out by talking about care within indigenous communities and then care within scientific communities and sometimes those overlap. Great. So for me, not studying indigenous communities as my research subjects, but turning the gaze back on, uh, back on to genetic anthropologists, other anthropologists, geneticists, that's an act of care for my people and for other indigenous people. We need to gather knowledge about them because they construct a world that we have to inhabit. And so we should do reconnaissance in their world. Um, and also in a way that for me makes them a subject. So there is that performative kind of ethical move. So I care for my people by feeling that I can defend indigenous sovereignty in part by engaging critically with science. We have a lot of attorneys. Uh, we're always fighting our sovereignty battles in court. But we do not have enough scientists. We don't have science policy advisors. And tribal tribes have governments in the United States, a little bit different in Canada, they, although they also have governance structures there. But governments need science policy advisors. We govern through science. And we live in a nation in which we are supposed to govern through science. And in order to sit at a policymaking table with the settler state, you are expected to speak a certain language. And we, we need to be able to engage critically with science in order to defend our sovereignty, I think. Um, the second 
thing is I began studying geneticists and I quickly got uncomfortable. I thought it would be better studying them than studying indigenous people, but it still was uncomfortable mm -hmm. because I was a feminist and it felt like bad feminist practice to be going into all of these scientific meetings and communities all the time and having a 100% antagonistic project. Now, there's a, there's, there's a, it's good that I do antagonistic work that's critical, but the longer I stayed in those communities, the more I wanted to also be in productive conversation in ways that wasn't just critiquing what they were doing, but I wanted to find ways to especially work with the critical scientists I met, the feminist scientists, the uh, people of color, indigenous scientists, the queer scientists who had similar critiques to the critiques I have, mm -hmm. which is that science has built itself by exploiting the study of their bodies and their lives, right? I wanted to work with them because I saw that the battles that they were in within scientific fields. And so then I started really investing in their careers as well and, and started investing in, for example, the training of indigenous bioscientists and doing bioethics faculty work within summer programs. So it was weird, and, but my planning background gave me, helped make it intelligible for me what was happening because a lot of people might have a, a kind of identity, a professional identity crisis at that point. Wait, am I an anthropologist? what am I doing here? And for me, I thought, well, I am an anthropologist, but I can also then slip into my planner mode and be a planner and help build programs. And, and so a lot of the last probably 10 years, methodologically, I've been trying to write and think and talk about how one moves between those different modes of working. And planning gave me a great language for figuring out how to change institutions from within that I don't think anthropology gives us. Mm -hmm. And feminist objectivity helped me methodologically defend that because I never bought into the idea of objectivity as neutrality. I bought into strong objectivity, right? This idea that, that um, having multiple diverse approaches to understanding a problem gives us a more robust form of understanding. Mm, mm. I was just wanting to go back to what you were saying about the different toolkits that were provided to you by your background in planning, for example, vis-a-vis right. -vis your background in anthropology. Um, and I'm wondering if within your work in disrupting these various spaces of power or questioning them and working alongside them as well, um, what do you think that was particular about anthropology that gave it a sort of political, um, a political edge? Or what was brought to you by the discipline of anthropology within those spaces? Well, you know, I didn't have to go that route, right? Being in History of Consciousness, which is a humanities program, and, and I particularly didn't do a PhD in anthropology mm -hmm. because I didn't want to defend the boundaries of the discipline. That, to me, is a waste of time. Mm -hmm. I don't have an identity as an anthropologist. My identity is as a Dakota person. <laughs> My identity is probably as somebody who is critically invested in science now. Um, but I kept being drawn back to the methods of anthropology. So despite growing up with this deeply antagonistic view of it, because I grew up under the tutelage of Vine Deloria Jr., I, real, I, I think at heart I kind of am an anthropologist. I'm deeply interested in different cultures from mine, be they you know, different national cultures or different disciplinary cultures. Um, I'm somebody who can go into a community and even though I'm very different there, I like to be quiet and observe. And I just, I think people are interesting. Um, even when I don't agree with them, I think they're really interesting. And I take it as a mark of pride that I can be in a place that's uncomfortable and get something out of it. And this might come from being an indigenous person in a reservation border town, uh, but somebody who was really deeply interested in school and academic things and less interested in ceremonial and quote unquote traditional things. So I grew up, my friend Evan Kirksey, who's also an anthropologist says, oh, you're just a boundary object yourself. And I think I grew up as a boundary object. Well, that makes for a really kind of good anthropologist. And so I kept getting drawn back to anthropological method and I was reading ethnographies and I, and Jim Clifford, who was my other PhD advisor, kept saying to me, Kim, are you sure you're not an anthropologist? <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> and then I finally realized, okay, I am in part. I really value uh, the insights that the methods give us, but I don't have to spend my time defending anthropology as a field. I, you know, um, And so that's kind of how it happened. I was really naturally drawn to it, but because I have a stronger identity, which is as a Dakota person, I don't, a lot of anthropologists get overly invested in their identity as anthropologists. I don't mm. get that. Mm. You know, I, I hang out with them, but I don't want to go be a member of their tribe but I'm totally comfortable going to all their functions and hanging out in their culture. I, I like that, but I don't want to be them. Mm. So maybe mm. I am though, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> um, there were a couple of things, so moving away from kind of anthropology as the, as the center of gravity here, mm -hmm. um, there are a couple of uh, 
ways that you frame your modes of thinking or modes of thinking that you've used in your work mm -hmm. that I find really interesting. Uh, one of them, just to Thank return you. to the point on um, to the point on multi-species and interspecies right. uh, was an article that you wrote in which you argued that from an indigenous standpoint, um, multi-species ways of thinking are necessary and vital and prior. And so I'm just wondering if you would be able to speak to um, the place of multi-species methodologies and modes of thought, both in academia but also outside of academia, you know, that, that turn within the academy to multi-species ethnography, to the new materialisms, to critical animal studies, those ways of thinking really can't totally encompass indigenous ways of thinking about human and other than human relations, but they're a really positive step. Mm -hmm. And I feel that in this particular moment, as you have anthropologists, philosophers, political theorists within the academy, beginning to think more carefully about how to have uh, more productive intimate relations with other than humans that are according them more agency or vibrancy or whatever term you come to be comfortable with. Now we're at a moment when we can have better conversations with indigenous thinkers and not just when I use the term thinker, I don't just mean academics, I mean indigenous thinkers out in the communities as well. Um, and I feel like we're at that moment right now. And that's why, you know, today I, we had a panel here at the American Anthropological Association with, with indigenous and, and non-indigenous allies who think about the, the ways that indigenous people are thinking about those relations with other than humans. And, and we're at a moment when we can fill a room with people that understand what we're talking about. And I think that that turn to thinking about those things in the academy, that indigenous thinkers within the academy need, need to be at the forefront of that theorizing, because there's a lot that indigenous communities, despite the ravages of colonization, there are ways of relating that we haven't forgotten about and we don't need to renew or come up with a new language to talk about how to relate with other than humans in less hierarchical ways. Like academics are coming up with new languages in part because they're wed to quote unquote secular ways of thinking about the world. And that's fine um, and they can look for those secular languages but in indigenous communities, we have those ways of thinking within our indigenous languages. And that's why I encourage my students actually to not only theorize in English but to bring indigenous language terms into, into English and try to translate them because there's a tremendous amount of uh, theoretical traction I think they're going to get by going into those languages and looking at the way that relations are spoken about in ways we don't do in English and we can't maybe. Mm. And speaking of relations, and I notice this is a term that you draw from Tagalog, yeah. I believe. Tagalog. Tagalog, yeah. <laughs> my mistake. Um, but yeah, I think that you make a really key point in one of your articles about um, keeping these sorts of knowledges and these modes of work within relationships when you talk about uh, standing with and speaking as faith. And so I'm just wondering if you might right. be able to flesh out those terms a little. Well, the concept of being in relation or relationality, that comes out of a lot of indigenous languages. So in my own uh, ancestors language, Dakota, David Shorter today was talking about within UMA. But the, the standing with and speaking as faith concept, I don't speak Tagalog, but I um, you know, I was reading the work of Nefertiti Tatiyar, and she, that term Sampalataya, which I'm probably not pronouncing correctly, is a term she takes out of Tagalog, and she's Filipina, and, she's, and she defined it as standing with and speaking as faith, and that was an aha moment for me. That helped me articulate the way that I work as a former planner who's now an, an anthropologist. It gave me a, a, a word. And it, perhaps in Dakota, if I spoke the word, I would find another word. But I thought that was really useful because what happens in, and this is, this is something that nags at a lot of indigenous anthropologists or insider anthropologists, people who study within their own communities, you worry about misrepresenting the will or the views of your people, but you're asked when you're off as an indigenous person in the academy to represent those views, and we anguish over that a lot. But her language helped me realize, wait a minute, I don't have to perfectly represent the diverse views of my people or the official traditional Dakota view. Mm -hmm. because, but what I can do is say I'm already invested in, in that community. I stand with other Dakota people. That's where I come from. I have a right to stand there. I come out of that world and I speak in concert with them. And it, it was just a, a, a conceptual turn that helped me figure out how to continue speaking authoritatively and robustly while still acknowledging that I can't represent everything that they would say. But I speak in faith, meaning I speak towards a world in which I want Dakota people to survive and thrive. And the work that I do is, uh, 
not on behalf of them in this sort of patronizing way, but it's, it's work that I do as I stand with them. And, and there was a way in which that term allows both for ongoing work, um, assertive speaking, and yet a sense of humility as well, that I can be critiqued by my own community and I can be reined back in. We need to find those kinds of ethical and conceptual spaces where we can stand, where we're not handicapped mm -hmm. by these Western notions of objectivity and perfect representation. And it's hard to do that when we're always operating in English, when we're always operating in those concepts in the academy that are not our ethical concepts. And so, yes, I picked a Tagalog term because it was like a light bulb going on over my head. And I hope Nefertiti would not mind. Um, but, but again, that, so that's me taking her term and theorizing with it. Um, and that's what I encourage my students to do in whatever indigenous language they work with. Mm, and it's obviously something that many anthropologists grapple with is yeah. a way of operating ethically in the world is with those politics of representation right, right. and yeah, the touchiness around that. Yeah, and, and the, you know, the academic English is hard. It's hard to, f it, I didn't get a light bulb with that, that kind of language. Mm. Um, speaking of language, um, there was a, I, I saw you mention in a talk I was at a few years ago um, in Kentucky um, that you were, in response to one of the questions, you mentioned um, the, the necessity to work around, I don't think language preservation is necessarily the right term, but being able to retain a rich vocabulary mm -hmm. from as many peoples as possible. Obviously, mm -hmm. that's something that anthropologists in the past and contemporary anthropologists are involved in as well. Right. Um, but I'm just wondering if you might be able to speak to the importance of Well, of that. you know, I think um, not, and I think anthropology is probably turning. I know linguistic anthropologists who do work in close collaboration with indigenous communities. I think not viewing it as salvage anthropology, right, as saving a dying language, but I, but I do think it's important that people are doing that work, but that they're doing it in a way that's uh, hooking up with the efforts of indigenous communities ourselves. We're doing a lot of language preservation and revitalization. This is a big focus for indigenous uh, thinkers, right? Mm -hmm. um, many communities across the world and across the country that I have worked with have uh, immersion language programs, they have language nests, they have language schools. Uh, the language is an integral part of their regular kind of, uh, you know, K through 12 education. Um, and so I think there are probably increasing opportunities, especially if anthropologists change their ethical frameworks and their conceptual frameworks from that old school salvage anthropology to more of a kind of planners or an institution builders work, that they, there are ways that they can find to do uh, collaborative research, right? Mm -hmm. um, and research that's also doing curriculum development and research that's also building capacity, maybe also training indigenous lingu linguists and indigenous linguistic anthropologists. And so that's the kind of uh, thing that I would advocate in the way that I work with geneticists. I do think it's really important that we, that we uh, maintain and sustain these languages because, again, there are things you can't think in English that you can think in Dakota, and that's, that's important. You know, I think we have things that are important for sustaining our own communities, but I think there are also knowledges in indigenous languages that can help sustain the world. Um, it's an impoverished view of the world to just be operating in English and some other major world languages. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, final question, I know we're running out of time. Uh, because this is a course on the anthropology of current world issues, we mm -hmm. often ask our interviewees to comment on whatever is a big okay. issue in the world at the moment. I've heard you speak a couple of times compellingly about particular reactions to the, US, to the recent US election results. Mm -hmm. Um, and how they might be missing a bigger picture. I'm just wondering if you might be able to, if you might want to comment on that. Yeah, um, I've been really dismayed by the domestic analysis in the U.S. And I would have known that, noticed this before because I've always been pretty anti-American, and I mean anti-American exceptionalism. Even growing up as an American, I was like that. I'm especially more like that now that I live in Canada and after I've traveled the world <laughs> in the last 20 years. Um, the U.S. domestic analyses, whether they were right-wing, uh, centrist conservative, Democrat or progressive, all of them across the spectrum, are, it seems to me, about 90 to 95 percent domestic analyses. And the arguments were over what's good for the country, how are racialized peoples, gendered peoples, you know, LGBTQ, all kinds of marginalized bodies, how are they going to fare worse under a right-wing regime versus a, a, a democratic regime? Sure, but what about the rest of the world that has been suffering for a long time by U.S. hegemony? You know, there's tons of brown bodies that suffered across the world under President Obama, President Clinton, all of them. 
And I was so dismayed by that. There's very little accountability by most Americans to what the U.S. does in the world. And for me, that, that notion of American exceptionalism, whether it's a conservative right wing or a progressive left wing view, we need to, we progressives need to really think hard about that and think critically about that. There is no American exceptionalism that does not do violence to the planet, period. And I don't care if it's better within U.S. borders, you know, uh, uh, under a particular kind of, you know, left wing view than the right wing view. It all does violence globally. And it's all predicated upon indigenous dispossession and ongoing genocide. And I just don't think as progressives, if we're really critical and we want to live in good relation with this planet and in good relation with diverse peoples, that we can hang on to the American dream anymore. And by which I mean U.S. hegemony, U.S. exceptionalism. There is no good U.S. exceptionalism. Mm. That's what I think of that, the election mm. and what's happened. Mm. It's <laughs> so. such an important perspective. Thanks for sharing it. You're welcome. Um, is there anything else that you would like to add or that's lingering at no, all? No, those or? were good questions. Okay, great. Yeah, thank well, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us and thanks for having us here as well. Thanks. Appreciate it. Good luck with your educational project. Thank you. <laughs>